Good evening and welcome to the keynote proceedings of this year's Institute for Honor. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Washington and Lee School of Law Professor Kish Perella. She has degrees from Duke and from the University of Cambridge. She teaches international economic law and corporate social responsibility. Her role this evening is one of the class of 1960 Professor of Ethics and Law. The class of 60, of course, being the sponsor and funder of the Institute for Honor. She has been the primary architect of this year's Institute for Honor, and she will now introduce the keynote speaker, Professor Perella. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank the class of 1960 for supporting these important conversations that we begin today, but we continue tomorrow. The theme of the 2023 Institute for Honor Symposium ponders the following question. What are the responsibilities of a corporation or other business in times of war? The relevance of this question is painfully clear. Last week marks the one year since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. According to the United Nations, as of mid-February 2023, there have been at least 8,000 non-combatant deaths and with another 13,000 um, injured by the war. In addition, the United Nations estimates that the war has led to over 8 million refugees from Ukraine who are now seeking refuge in Europe. In response to this war, the world is wondering what should we do to help Ukraine and its people? Certainly, governments are attempting to stop the war through a variety of measures. The United States, in combination with other countries, have introduced economic sanctions on Russian entities, sectors, and individuals. In addition, the United States has provided uh, military aid packages to Ukraine. But how about the rest of us? What are our own responsibilities to aid those suffering from a war, or even to contribute to its end? Corporate leaders have already begun to answer this question. Following the invasion of Ukraine, many corporations have left Russia. Others have found ways to offer humanitarian assistance. The Russian invasion of Ukraine and the corporate responses to it raise important questions for us to ponder. For business leaders, business students, and those who advise them, this week's conversations are about understanding the various ethical considerations that business leaders need to balance in order to decide on these difficult questions. After all, the Russian conflict is, among, is one among several conflicts in the world, and there are more on the horizon. Business leaders and future business leaders, some perhaps in this room, will need to decide how they are going to navigate these crises. These questions are also important for those of us who are not business leaders. What is our obligation to help in the face of a global humanitarian crisis? How do our corporations represent us on the world stage? After all, we interact with corporations in our everyday lives. We buy goods and services from them, we work for them, we invest in them. Therefore, what they do on the world stage matters to us. So how do we go about evaluating whether they are doing the right thing or not? Fortunately, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers who will help us answer these questions. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the first of our illustrious speakers. Ambassador David Sheffer is the senior fellow, senior fellow on the Council of Foreign Relations and professor of practice at Arizona State University. He has had an illustrious diplomatic career, and it is my pleasure to give you a few of the highlights. David, uh, Ambassador Sheffer negotiated the creation of five war crimes tribunals, the International Criminal Tribunals of the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, and the International Criminal Court. During the first term of the Clinton administration, Ambassador Sheffer served as senior advisor and counsel to the US Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Dr. Madeleine Albright, 
and he served on the Deputies Committee of the National Security Council. During the second term of the Clinton administration, Ambassador Sheffer was the first ever U.S. Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues and led the United States delegation to the United Nations talks establishing the International Criminal Court. He signed the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court on behalf of the United States on December 31, 2000. From 2012 to 2018, he was a United Nations Secretary General Special Expert on United Nations Assistance to the Khmer Rouge Trials. In addition to his diplomatic career, he has held a number of very prestigious positions at a number of universities in this country. He was the Mayor Brown, Robert A. Hellman Professor of Law at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law, and has held visiting professorships at George Uni Georgetown University Law Center and George Washington University Law School. Ambassador Sheffer earned degrees from Harvard College, Oxford University, and Georgetown University Law Center. Please uh, help me in welcoming him to the podium. Well, thank you, Kish, for that very generous uh, introduction. And I just want to thank all of you who are here today, uh, including the dean of the law school. I understand the uh, other leadership, perhaps the vote provost or vice provost is here today, uh, and others. Um, so I, I really do appreciate it. And my old friend, Mark Drumble, just walked in from the law school. Hi, Mark. Good to see you again. We've been in the trenches for a long, many years. Um, it's tremendous to be back in Lexington and the Shenandoah Valley. 30 years ago, I owned a cabin in the hills of Rockingham County, very close to the West Virginia border, and enjoyed my weekend getaways from the Washington scene to that forested environment where I did a lot of writing and just sitting on the porch with a beer or something a bit stronger. Then along came my first child and my work in the Clinton administration, and gone were the weekends in the Shenandoah Valley. So I do envy this beautiful location. And thank you to Professor Kish uh, Perella for your tireless efforts in bringing me to the campus today to speak with this distinguished audience. Um, and also thank you to the leadership and to everyone, including uh, Lisa D'Amelio, who has made this possible for me. I am deeply grateful. I apologize in advance, but we have some serious matters to talk about during the next hour. I do look forward to your questions once I've completed my prepared remarks which should last about 30 to 35 minutes, period. The title of this address is Corporate Responsibility for Waging and Ending Armed Conflict, which in part points to the use of deadly firepower and the fate of so many victims of aggression, armed conflict, human rights abuses, and atrocity crimes uh, globally. My remarks focus on corporations in the business of arms manufacturing and sales recognizing that the topic of corporate responsibility is much, much wider in terms of sanctions enforcement and how multinational corporations have to weigh their role in international trade and investment concerning warring parties. All of that will be covered in tomorrow's uh, symposium by the expert scholars and practitioners in this field uh, who follow me. We now live in the reality of an increasingly fractured world of a character few of us imagined would emerge decades after the end of the Cold War, when a new world order seemed so possible. As I tell my students when we meet every week, once again, the world changed since our last class. So we meet a little over a year after the full-scale Russian aggression against Ukraine launched on February 24th, 2022 following the initial aggression of 2014 against Crimea and eastern regions of Ukraine. The daily news has been saturated with how the armaments and munitions that weaponize both the power of aggression and the power of self-defense have rained down on both sides military forces on the Ukrainian territory and on the Ukrainian people, leaving many tens of thousands dead and wounded among civilian populations and military personnel, including in far greater numbers, Russian soldiers. The Ukrainian defense against the Russian aggression has depended upon the ability of corporations 
that manufacture munitions and military assets like artillery, rifles, tanks, drones, aircraft, surveillance equipment, and cyber capabilities to accelerate their production lines, largely at taxpayer expense. The aim is to equip the Ukrainian military with the resources needed to wage self-defense in the face of an unprovoked, blatant, and aggressive assault by the Russian military and its mercenaries across Ukraine's sovereign borders, breaking the most fundamental tenets of international law found in the United Nations Charter. Indeed, the good guys appear to be the arms manufacturers that rise to the challenge in response to U.S. government policy to aid both the Ukrainian military as well as U.S. allies newly concerned with their own defense capabilities. A recent meeting I attended in Washington with the Prosecutor General of Ukraine included several high-tech American companies deeply engaged in assisting Ukraine by providing sophisticated drone warfare and surveillance instruments. These are being used not only to fight a war, but also to provide the critical information about the character and location of atrocities that will aid investigators in building cases of atrocity crimes, namely genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and aggression. Little did at least some of us engaged in human rights and the corporate responsibility disciplines imagine we would be advocating for greatly expanding the manufacture and export to Ukraine and Taiwan and US allies of the deadly weapons of war. But that is where at least I find myself in the face of an aggressive war that has changed the world. As you are well aware, the People's Republic of China may be emboldened to invade Taiwan, particularly if Ukraine loses the fight against Russia. Just this week, Congress approved $619 million worth of weapons deals with Taiwan, primarily under contracts with Raytheon and Lockheed Martin corporations. Arms exports from the United States are directly tied to preventing further human rights violations and atrocity crimes in Ukraine and to increasing regional security in Europe and East Asia among partners and allies. Just as during World War II, America's manufacturing base was radically transformed to produce the armaments of war and for good cause, we are witnessing a similar, though relatively less expansive, phenomenon today. Great power competition has returned among the United States, Russia, and China. U.S. allies are lining up to protect their own security interests. Our allies are in the market to amass arms and munitions capabilities as tools of deterrence against Russia and China and to fortify their own sovereignty. This shift to there being a moral necessity to support and enable larger armaments manufacturing and sales of weapons of war to foreign allies and friends presents a paradox in both legal and public policy thinking about corporate social responsibility in the realm of warfare. Within the last year, arms manufacturers have been transformed, at least in part, to simultaneously function as instruments to defend fundamental principles of international law, namely sovereignty and human rights, including the essential right to life, while also acting as instruments that continue to contribute to violent deaths and unwarranted decimation of civilian populations through arms sales that end up in the hands of governments, militias, and cartels with criminal intentions, whether under national law or international law violations. Reflecting on the first prong of the paradox, namely the good guy phenomenon, of corporations building and selling weapons as tools to defend sovereignty in connection with the Ukraine war and Taiwan security, overall international arms sales from the United States, both government and direct commercial sales, have ballooned over the past year. Defense News reported that, quote, sales of military weapons between the United States and foreign governments shot up to nearly $51.9 billion in fiscal year 2022 largely because U.S. allies in Europe are rushing to arm themselves in the wake of Russia's invasion of Europe, of uh, Ukraine. The total represented a 49% jump from $34.8 billion in sales the previous year, according to new State Department data. Another source reports the U.S. arms offers experienced a major surge in 2022, 
to $65 billion. And now I want to just start to give you just a little flavor of this with um, some PowerPoint slides. You can see there the jump 2021 to 2022 over at the right side of the graph in terms of the value of U.S. arms offers that have, uh, that have accelerated in the past year. The United States has remained the largest supplier of military, financial, and humanitarian aid to Ukraine amid the war. And you can see that on this chart. Uh, the United States far outpaces any other country, including the European Union institutions, with respect to military, financial, and uh, uh, humanitarian uh, aid. Between 2022 uh, and uh, January 2022 and January 2023, the United States provided $46.4 billion in military assistance to Ukraine, including over $40 billion in weapons and security assistance. And this slide shows you how that breaks down in terms of the United States and Ukraine. The red is the, is the military component, and the other colors are financial, and at the very top in green is the value in humanitarian aid. This military aid has encompassed infantry, arms, and equipment, drones and satellite technology, air and ground support, and enhanced communication systems. And this slide will show you it's, I don't expect you to read all this gibberish, but it just shows you that uh, how the Ukraine and, and is tapping into the U.S. arsenal, and all of this is available on CFR.org on, on the website of the Council on Foreign Relations. But it does show you the different types of military equipment and categories that are being tapped. U.S. Defense Security Cooperation Agency Director James Hirsch has asserted that the Ukraine war will drive continuing increases in foreign military sales over the next uh, several years. And this one shows how Ukraine, since the invasion of last year, has really ripped open uh, the amount of assistance that's being provided um, by the United States to uh, foreign uh, governments. Just this morning, the White House announced another large munitions deal with Ukraine, by the way. And this paradox in the case of Ukraine does not only affect the United States. In fact, by share of GDP, several Eastern European countries, including Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, are providing by far the most military, financial, and uh, humanitarian aid to uh, Ukraine. And there you can see, just by uh, in terms of the percentage of their gross domestic product, uh, Estonia is clearly making the largest sacrifice, followed by Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and then the United States, and then Bulgaria, Norway, United Kingdom, etc. This military, uh, I should say, um, sorry, lost my place here. Um, this means that um, uh, those countries' arms manufacturers must confront their role and responsibility as corporations uh, in the waging and ending of military conflicts and beyond. And I think the next uh, slide I want to kind of finish this episode with showing you the 42 countries around the globe that have provided military aid uh, to Ukraine over the last year. Now let me step back for a moment to make a larger point. Corporate social responsibility rights uh, for human rights has grown over the last three decades into a significant body of principles promoted by the United Nations, including prominently by the UN Secretary General and UN Human Rights Council. Corporations often highlight their compliance in annual reports and advertising, while national political leaders and non-governmental organizations promote the adoption of and adherence to these principles. The non-binding UN's Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, approved by the UN Human Rights Council in late 2011, has become the foundation for examining corporate performance. A treaty built upon the foundation laid by the Guiding Principles is currently under consideration by nations, but with serious difficulties. Also, for decades, there has been civil litigation in US courts to enforce human rights compliance by corporations under what we call the Alien Tort Statute. 
but which in recent years has been great, greatly truncated by conservative justices on the Supreme Court. Corporate responsibility principles have traditionally reflected negatively on those corporations, particularly arms manufacturers, that have profited from the sale of weapons that have been used to violate international human rights, the law of war and international humanitarian law. At a minimum, reputational damage has influenced how shareholders and the general public view the business of selling arms that are used to undermine or outright violate the human rights of civilian populations abroad. Despite the seeming turnaround in the challenge of arming Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression, we should step back and recall why the waging and ending of armed conflicts remain central to corporate responsibility in our time. One only has to examine recent, and for, uh, recent US and foreign litigation to understand how pervasive the sale and export of armaments by corporate arms manufacturers remains in foreign conflicts, inflicting immense harm on civilian populations. Sometimes these exports are illegal on their face and thus in violation of, for example, the Arms Export Control Act. Other times they are legal on their face but are then diverted into illegal uses against civilians by foreign powers and non-state actors. Let's walk through some recent cases about the arms trade. First, on October 19th, 2022, the Department of Justice announced in two separate cases, charges were filed against several corporate entities and individuals. Six individuals were arrested for the alleged illegal sale and unlawful export of powerful civil military dual use technologies to Russia, some of which have been recovered on battlefields in Ukraine while another nuclear proliferation technology was intercepted before reaching Russian soil. One of these cases brought charges against two European companies for violating US export laws by attempting to smuggle a dual use export controlled item, a high precision computer controlled grinding machine, which can be used in nuclear proliferation and defense programs. They sought to get that to Russia, but they failed. Secondly, there have been several cases in US and German federal courts dealing with the flood of arms into Mexico and Colombia, fueling drug cartel violence and armed conflicts. In September 2022, a federal judge dismissed a historic $10 billion lawsuit filed by Mexico against UN gun manufacturers to hold them accountable for facilitating weapons trafficking in drug cart to drug cartels uh, in, in Mexico. The suit accused Smith & Wesson Brands, Strum Ruger & Company, and Beretta USA Corp. and others of selling military-style assault weapons to cartels in Mexico. Mexico's foreign ministry said in a statement, quote, this suit by the Mexican government has received worldwide recognition and has been considered a turning point in the discussion about the gun industry's responsibility for the violence experienced in Mexico and the region, close quote. Mexico has appealed the dismissal. In contrast, two German federal court cases against arms manufacturers have been successful, resulting in the arms manufacturers paying large fines for the illegal exportation of assault weapons and other weapons to Colombia and Mexico, fueling violent conflict in these countries. Now, I want to spend a few moments on the crisis in Yemen, which shares top billing now with Ukraine as the worst humanitarian catastrophe in the world. It provides a prominent example where the armed conflict is fueled primarily by Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates on one side and Iran through its proxy force of Houthi rebels on the other side. The primary issue in lawsuits in France, Italy, and the United Kingdom is the alleged complicity of arms manufacturers in the use of their weapons fighter jets, missiles, guidance systems, bombs, etc., in targeted attacks on civilians in Yemen. In a 2019 British case, a court of appeals ruled that the country's arms sales to Saudi Arabia were unlawful, citing human rights concerns from Saudi Arabia's involvement in Yemen. The ruling prompted the suspension of new arms sales to Saudi Arabia by the British government, but Spoiler alert, they were resumed in 2020. <clears throat> the United States and the United Kingdom thus continue to supply arms to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, even as they are used to decimate Yemen. 
leading to the deaths of over 250,000 people since the onset of the conflict and fueling what the United Nations designated in 2019, long before Ukraine, as the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Over the last five years, the United States has comprised 39% of global arms exports, and I have a thing to that, um, in the world, with the U.S. Uh, manufacturers making billions from federal government contracts and direct commercial arms abroad. And then, I hope I've got this synchronized correctly for you, um, the top recipients of U.S. arms offers, as you can see, are, are listed there. Uh, Saudi Arabia comes in at 4.7 billion over on the right. Uh, United Arab Emirates at 3.48 billion uh, over on the far right. Of these exports, 43% have been sent to the Middle East. Saudi Arabia alone has received almost 25% of all U.S. arms exports, with the UAE, Afghanistan, Israel, and Egypt also purchasing major stores of U.S. weapons. And I think this one, this is a little too dense, but um, it just shows you uh, uh, by billions or millions of dollars the category of countries that are recip receiving uh, uh, these U.S. arms sales. Between 2015, well, the United States has, has been by far the largest supplier of weapons to Saudi Arabia. Between 2015 and 2019, nearly three quarters, 73% of Saudi Arabia's arms imports came from the United States, while 13% came from the United Kingdom. The arms sales have included combat jets, attack helicopters, missiles and launchers, large artillery, combat vehicles, small arms, light weapons, ammunition, and other munitions. To fuel its onslaught in Yemen, the Saudi uh, regime has bought billions of dollars worth of Boeing-made helicopters, along with Raytheon and Lockheed Martin manufactured missiles. Unfortunately, as far as I can ascertain, none of these U.S. manufactured arms exported to Saudi Arabia have been repurposed by Saudi Arabia to ship to Ukraine to fight Russian aggression. The weapons and technology manufactured and sold by major U.S. corporations, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and General Dynamics, have been used in incidents that killed civilians in daily scenarios of everyday life, including innocent civilians walk, attending weddings or traveling to school in Yemen. A 2019 report documenting 27 Saudi Arabia and UAE attacks on civilians in Yemen found remnants indicating that U.S.-made munitions were used in 25 of the 27 cases, and U.K. munitions were found in several cases. A 2019 CNN investigation found that Saudi Arabia and its coalition partners have transferred American-made weapons to Al-Qaeda-linked fighters, hardline Salafi uh, militia and other um, other factions waging war in Yemen in violation of their agreements with the United States. The problem is so pervasive in the case of Yemen that the UN's group of eminent international and regional experts on Yemen reported extensively about it in September 2020 and stated, quote, the group of eminent experts also reiterates its call for third states to stop transferring arms to parties to the conflict given the role of such transfers in perpetuating the conflict and potentially contributing to violations. No state can now claim to be unaware of the scale of violations occurring in Yemen. And as recently as two months ago, an Oxfam report out of the United Kingdom found that, quote, the Saudi-led coalition used weapons supplied solely by the United Kingdom and the United States in attacks of hundreds of attacks on civilians in Yemen between January 2022 and the end of February 2022. In one example occurring in January 2022, the Saudi-led co coalition used a precision-guided munition made in the United States in an airstrike on a detention center in Yemen, which killed at least 80 people and injured over 200. The laser-guided bomb used in the attack was manufactured by Raytheon. This attack was likely a war crime, and the issue arises where responsibility, including complicity, lies in the use of U.S. manufactured weapons in this manner by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, or other uh, um, uh, coalition partners. <clears throat> now, I will close my Yemen story by simply saying this has not missed attention uh, on Capitol Hill.
This misuse of U.S. missions and aircraft in Yemen has been so prominent and frankly so obvious that Congress has tried with large bipartisan majorities to shut down the trade of such arms with Saudi Arabia and UAE. In 2019, then President Trump vetoed three bills approved by bipartisan lawmakers. Two of the bills intended to block arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the third to the UAE. In June 2022, a bipartisan group of almost 50 members of Congress introduced a bill to invoke constitutional war powers and to end the unauthorized U.S. involvement in Saudi Arabia's assault on Yemen. That bill languished. But all is not lost. The final text of the National Defense Authorization Act, which President Biden signed into law in December 2022, stated at least a policy proposition that it's the policy of the United States to continue to support and further efforts to bring an end to the conflict in Yemen, to support efforts so that the United States defense articles and services are not used for military operations resulting in civilian casualties, and to work with allies and partners to address the ongoing humanitarian needs of Yemeni uh, citizens. And then it requires a very detailed report regarding all of those uh, civilian casualties and what's being done uh, to uh, diminish them. Now, the fact that the manufacturers of these armaments have demonstrated no real allegiance to social responsibility in enabling the U.S. government to buy the weapons and sell them to these two countries, essentially wiping their hands clean of the carnage that decimates the civilian population of Yemen, characterizes the perpetuation of armed conflicts through corporate profit-making. Essentially, the corporations can blame Washington for whatever transpires, transpires following the sales, as they are made at the behest of the U.S. government, and then absolve themselves of any responsibility. This is similar to how U.S. gun manufacturers feign any responsibility for massive flows of weapons to Mexico, because once sold legally to purchasers in the United States, they seemingly do not care what happens thereafter, including the smuggling of these weapons into Mexico to fuel drug cartel warfare and the deaths of thousands of Mexican citizens. How does one define that type of corporate social responsibility other than in the context of evasion and immorality? One final example is the Philippines, where between 2002 and 2021, the United States sold nearly $900 million in weapons and provided over $1.3 billion in security assistance. This included tens of millions of dollars in direct commercial arms sales. In this case, arming the government of then-President Rodrigo Duterte enabled the regime to harness American firepower to kill and imprison his own people. Beginning in 2016, thousands were executed as part of Duterte's war on drugs in extrajudicial killings, many of whom were armed with U.S.-made handguns, machine guns, and semi-automatic wep weapons to achieve those killings. Reportedly, Duterte oversaw the execution or arrest of more than 30,000 people who opposed the regime. Now, he is no longer president, but the Philippines remains one of the top five recipients of U.S. handguns. Duterte and others in his former leadership circle remain under investigation by the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity victimizing his own people. The question arises whether U.S. corporate and government officials might be complicit in such alleged criminal activity through actions that facilitated the sale and authorization of firearms to killing squads in the Philippines. So let's recap uh, the good guy point, and then I have a few suggestions, and then I'll close. Certainly on the issue of ending armed conflict, corporate social responsibility can be understood in Ukraine as arming the, that country to the teeth to win a war, and thus end it. You have all heard the arguments in the news that Ukraine must win the war on the battlefield in order to reach any kind of peace agreement with Russia. Ukraine needs the leverage of recaptured territory from Russian aggression and occupation. Corporations are on the front line of achieving that aim through their manufacture and sale, either directly or through government channels of armaments that can achieve victory. So one cannot understate how important massive arms flows are to the survival of Ukraine as a sovereign nation. But there would be few other examples that one could point to showing U.S. arms manufacturers as key drivers of conflict resolution 
and the termination of wars. On the prevention calculus, one can point to the increased armaments flowing to Taiwan as an example of arms manufactured by US corporations being used to prevent arms conflict and is signaling the high cost China would pay if it confronted the ramped up defenses of Taiwan. Beijing might ultimately prevail in occupying Taiwan, but at what cost, including entering pariah status globally? So what is to be done? I have some fairly simple suggestions, which I expect our panel of experts tomorrow to totally tear apart, because they have the expertise, not me. But first, I would call upon those corporations that manufacture arms and high-tech drones and surveillance instruments for use in armed conflicts to elect to their boards of directors one or more individuals whose primary role is to monitor both compliance with arms export laws and the actual use of the company's manufactured armaments in armed conflicts abroad and to bring such monitoring information to the direct attention of the board of directors in their meetings. Second, I propose that a civil society group create a comprehensive index of the use of US munitions in armed conflicts globally and the sources, character, and purpose of all such usages. Full transparency would be the goal. Third, the US Congress should remain in its oversight capacity a watchdog on how US munitions are being used abroad and, as in the Saudi Arabia UAE example, take a stand to prevent such uses for the commission of aggression or other atrocity crimes and to hold the executive branch to account, including through veto-proof legislation to shut down arms trades that clearly are being used illegally and immorally. Fourth, and in contrast to the bad guy side of arms manufacturers, there should be strong public support for increasing arms manufacturing to strengthen the Ukrainian military in its struggle against Russian aggression and for Taiwan in its defense against Chinese threats of invasion and domination. We should be able to live with the paradox that I have described and to do so with determination and eyes wide open. Fifth, the CEOs of US arms manufacturers and indeed foreign arms dealers, at least among US allies, should assume a leadership position to speak out and direct their company's products towards legal and worthy causes, rather than kowtow to the purchase orders of governments where the end use of the weapons is so questionable. I know I speak naively as business pursues its self-interest, but the corporate social responsibility movement of the last 30 years has made some progress in turning the tide of business conduct to worthy aims. Sixth, one could imagine developing a code of conduct, likely unenforceable but nonetheless impactful, that would be applied to government officials and corporate officers who use the revolving door to move seamlessly from government positions into the C-suites and boards of directors of the arm industry and back again into high government service. The code of conduct to which they would pledge their personal compliance would state that they would use their knowledge experience, and careers in public and private life to ensure that the arms industry conducts its business strictly in accordance with national and international law, and that all efforts, including denial of sales opportunities, would be made to curtail the use of such armaments in acts of aggression or atrocity crimes. An implausible idea, yeah. Naive, yeah. But imagine a world where men and women with sheer integrity, courage, and influence sign such a pledge and publish it on a full page in the New York Times. Further imagine the individual or foundation that would step forward to purchase that space in the Times for such a pledge to be shared with all of us. Finally, high-tech corporations play an increasingly important, indeed at times dominant role in waging modern warfare and transforming armed conflict into cyber warfare. For several years, there has been an initiative led by Microsoft to provide some regulation of cyber capabilities to protect civilian populations. Since the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and their protocols of 1977 do not explicitly address cyber warfare, 
There is a critical need to provide a similar shield that would protect civilians not only during traditional warfare, but also during the shattery in-between scenarios of using cyber capabilities to endanger the lives and well-being of civilians even during peacetime. A digital Geneva Convention has been drafted and governments are examining its merits. And I just want to show you, these are the six principles that you can see there. The six basic principles of the digital Geneva Convention would be no targeting of tech companies, private sector or critical infrastructure, assist private sector efforts to detect, contain, respond to, and recover from events, report vulnerabilities to vendors rather than to stockpile, sell, or exploit them, exercise restraint in developing cyber weapons and ensure that any developed are limited, precise, and not reusable, commit to non-proliferation activities to uh, uh, cyber weapons, and limit offensive operation to avoid a mass event. Now, Fred, uh, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, has championed the digital Geneva Convention and proposed the creation of an international organization to monitor compliance with the convention. He has written, quote, while there is no perfect analogy, the world needs an organization that can address cyber threats in a manner like the role played by the International Atomic Energy Agency in the field of nuclear nonproliferation. This organization should consist of technical experts from across governments, the private sector, academia, and civil society with the capability to examine specific attacks and share the evidence showing that a given attack was by a specific nation state. Only then will nation states know that if they violate the rules, the world will learn about it." Close quote. These are worthy objectives. Of course, there is no easy pathway to ensuring that corporations focus on international law and international human rights protections when they become actors in the arena of warfare. But I hope I've been able to shed some light today on some of the issues at play as we navigate the treacherous terrain for corporate responsibility in the years ahead. And that concludes my formal remarks today, and I look forward to some questions. So I'm game. You know, listen, students ask me questions 5,000 times a day, so go for it. Yes? Yeah, I, I actually don't know. I mean, it's, it's obviously because Ukraine has dominated uh, the news, and also Yemen doesn't have a large diaspora um, that generates interest, obviously, in what's going on back in, in the, the home country. Um, so uh, it's, it's also rare that you see the international media actually arrive in Yemen, in part because it's a very dangerous place to be, um, and it would, it would take you know, security to be able to cover it uh, adequately as a journalist. Um, so uh, it's also, I think, an uncomfortable subject uh, for any U.S. administration to address in light of this, what I described as this very, um, this very determined effort to continue to arm Saudi Arabia and UAE despite the interests that have been expressed by a large bipartisan uh, group of, of American uh, uh, legislators and, and, of course, also by so many in civil society. Uh, there are interests at stake uh, with Saudi Arabia and UAE, and I think that tends not to uh, bring that issue to the fore in State Department briefings or otherwise. Yes. Right. Sure. I mean, that's been with us ever since the Iraq experience uh, of the early 2000s, when so many U.S. mercenaries were actually stationed in Iraq and then also in Afghanistan and the various incidents that occurred in connection with those deployments. But yes, I mean, all I can say is uh, uh, regulation of, of uh, 
U.S. mercenaries uh, and, and of uh, U.S. corporations that obviously profit from the contracts that send those mercenaries into these, these combat zones and security zones, um, that would be very, uh, very useful initiative, yes. Mark, Professor Drumble. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. And I just want to emphasize, Mark, that um, I confine this discussion only to arms manufacturing. There's a huge corporate world out there of so much other types of trade and otherwise. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a strong possibility any time within uh, the next decade or so for criminal liability at the international level of, of corporate uh, uh, conduct of this character. It's just because it's such a high mountain to climb. I mean, as a negotiator, I dealt with this very directly in the 1990s as we headed up to the 1998 finalization of the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, which only has jurisdiction over people. It has no jurisdiction over corporate entities, legal entities. Um, and the suggestion was made uh, to cover corporations during the talks, but it ran up against a um, a very pragmatic wall that was erected very quickly by governments, and something that I engaged in in discussions too, whereby we have made it a point that all of the criminality that we were putting into the Rome Statute would be something we could defend as having already been established under customary international law, so that there would be no dispute about the, the, the legitimacy of what we were criminalizing under the Rome Statute. Um, and the problem with corporate criminal liability at the international level is that it just had not reached that level of criminality yet in corporate and in customary international law to be confident whatsoever. Also, um, by trying to put it into the Rome Statute, we sort of would have created considerable jeopardy to the Rome Statute itself because we would have run up against a buzzsaw of, of opposition from so many governments for having done so. So it was not put into the Rome Statute. However, that doesn't prohibit uh, the prosecutor from investigating business executives who use their influence and power in corporations to actually pursue with criminal intent the commission of atrocity crimes, perhaps using their corporations as the vehicles for doing so. So there's nothing preventing the prosecutor from looking at businessmen, and this is why um, currently the prosecutor, Kareem Khan, who's a, Br a British barrister, he's the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, he is uh, uh, surely, I'm not inside his office obviously, but he is surely looking at the role of Russian oligarchs in fueling the Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, with the various assets and influence that they have. Doesn't mean that all the oligarchs are doing this, but certainly there are some that would be key to any scrutiny, uh, those who are very close to Putin, et cetera, and who clearly um, uh, probably participated in some discussions and also in how to provide uh, the military assistance to the military to uh, conduct their aggression uh, against uh, Ukraine. So those are businessmen, those oligarchs. They're just simply businessmen, but they, they will be under scrutiny. Um, so that's a possibility. I must say that when the first prosecutor of, um, uh, you probably remember this, the first prosecutor, Luis Moreno Campo of the International Criminal Court delivered a speech in San Francisco uh, 
suggesting this possibility that businessmen might be subject to his scrutiny, he ran into a firestorm of opposition by American companies and also by a particular federal judge at that time who couldn't believe what he was hearing. Oh, what do you mean, American businessmen, or any businessmen? But of course, the, Ocampo was actually technically right. I mean, that they could be subject to scrutiny, provided that he has jurisdiction over that particular individual. And remember, the United States at this point is not a, a state party to uh, the Rome Statute. So in other words, American businessmen uh, would not be subject to that kind of scrutiny unless, unless they're performing duties on the territories of state parties to the court, then it's, it's entirely possible the prosecutor might take a look at those multinational efforts uh, by U.S. companies and the leadership of those U.S. companies in, with respect to those multinational corporations. Yes? Uh, it certainly, oh, I'm sorry, I think I'm supposed to repeat the questions. I'm so sorry, I forgot to do that. So sorry. Uh, I have been asked uh, by the gentleman, what about the social, uh, corporate social responsibility of gun manufacturers in the United States for the use of their weapons in the United States uh, for the commission of crimes? Um, there is litigation underway in many respects uh, uh, with, with respect to trying to hold gun manufacturers liable. And frankly, I would leave it to my experts tomorrow who probably know that litigation. In fact, I know, know that litigation far better than I do to answer your question. But it's certainly a very fair point. Um, there clearly, I, I've focused on the international scene as I normally do, but domestically, uh, there's a huge corporate social responsibility issue for gun manufacturers in the United States with respect to the sale of their weapons. And just as I uh, gave a suggestion of what someone on the board of directors could do with respect to foreign use of U.S. manufactured guns, that same individual could also be a tool for bringing to the board of directors' attention the domestic use of the product so at least there's some corporate attention to this at the board of directors level. Um, but in terms of litigation, uh, those cases are there on the federal dockets. And um, the exact fate of those cases, I'm not the expert to ask about. But uh, you're absolutely right that that, that issue is a targeted issue uh, uh, by those uh, uh, victim groups, in particular in the United States who wish to bring that uh, uh, to the fore in federal court. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's that's a good. I know what you're going to ask. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I, I again, I would leave this to my experts tomorrow. But um, uh, I would say this question is the 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 suit brought by Mexico against U.S. gun manufacturers for the sale of so many weapons that ended up in Mexico. Uh, and used in the drug cartels and the murders there because those weapons were identified as having been these U.S. manufactured weapons when they were picked up at the crime scenes. Um, I think, uh, as I recall, one of the issues was jurisdiction. In other words, to what extent does the government of Mexico actually have jurisdiction to sue a U.S. gun manufacturer who would argue and probably try to show by evidence that these weapons were actually sold legally in the United States. The problem is they were then smuggled 
from the United States into Mexico to commit these crimes. But what standing does the government of Mexico have to actually bring those cases in a federal court? I could stand corrected, but I seem to recall that was one of the uh, issues. Now, they have appealed that, so we'll see what happens. Yes? That's right. The question is, isn't this argument that I presented sort of futile because whatever the United States might actually achieve with respect to um, U.S. manufacturers and also how the U.S. government handles those U.S. manufacturers as well as mercenaries of U.S. citizenship uh, or corporate structure who are then deployed overseas to commit, uh, uh, you know, crimes during the performance of their duties as mercenaries. What good is all of that if, frankly, uh, there is success at shutting that down, other countries will just fill in the gap very, very quickly, whether it be Russia, China, uh, some, some European companies, et cetera. And that's absolutely true. I mean, there's no question about it that there is a futility to this because the arms industry is so huge and it has so many um, uh, opportunities globally to actually uh, manufacture and sell these weapons um, that it's it's a tough it's a tough um, uh, mountain to climb however the United States is the largest uh, uh, exporter of these weapons so I think trying to get a grip on it here in the United States and then use that example uh, to work with our allies and others to shut down some of this uh, at an international level is worth the is worth the effort, and you have a follow up. Right. Yeah. So he's asked, what are the incentives for actually trying to get foreign arms manufacturers to shut down? Uh, uh, their participation in activities that end up using those weapons illegally, et cetera. And I would simply say, actually, there's, there's very little you can incentivize other than to ensure that their governments, the governments that have jurisdiction over these foreign arms manufacturers, are in fact enforcing their arms export uh, laws faithfully and diligently and rigorously with these companies. Uh, in other words, that's a multilateral diplomatic challenge among the United States and various governments to ensure that we have a unified understanding of how to actually regulate the, the manufacture and sale of these weapons uh, globally. Obviously, sales are going to always take place and they're going to end up in the wrong hands occasionally, uh, but um, that's really a diplomatic challenge among governments. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, he, he pointed out that it's, it's also important to recognize beyond Ukraine and Taiwan that there are other U.S. allies out there, South Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, Indonesia, um, at least as a friend, Indonesia as a friend, um, who uh, are, are standing there looking at their own security requirements. And yes, there can be a good guy participation by the United States. That's why one of those charts that I showed uh, tried to point out just uh, how many of these um, countries, I think it's this one, yeah. Top recipients of US arms offers, Indonesia, Greece, Germany, Australia, Poland, Egypt, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates. So among that group, despite the presence of Saudi Arabia and UAE who are flagrantly misusing these weapons, uh, there's a lot of US allies who, who merit that arms trade for their, their own security purposes. And I, I would emphasize, that's why I did emphasize Ukraine, Taiwan, and US allies who are, who, uh, uh, merit these uh, security concerns. Thank you, okay. Dr. Shepherd, for those wonderful remarks. Thank you. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we're going to start talking about the tech sector with uh, Shannon Rock Singh, who is the former acting head of human rights at Twitter, and who's after Eric and George. We're going to lead the conversation talking about other sectors and the responsibility of corporations in a variety of different contexts. So I hope you will join us then when we have follow up panel talking about the executive's role in sort of guiding these decisions. We'll talk about some of Ambassador Shepard's solutions that involve board representation. And to guide those conversations, we have Michael Fincer um, and Lizanne Thomas, who will also help us think through some of these and some other ideas. So thank you very much. If you want to join us now for the reception and dinner,